There we go. There Can we you are. all see me now? Everything looks okay. good. Thank you all. Thank you, Ignatius. So I'll be your host for the, the next presentation. And uh, again, I think everyone's used to what to do. Uh, if you have a question, go ahead and direct me in the chat. And then uh, we will uh, read them off during the, the periods we have for that. So this next um, presentation is Exaggerated Perspectives in Haiku. And the presenter is Deborah Kologi. And uh, Deborah is the California Regional Coordinator for the Haiku Society of America. Uh, she's a member of board of directors for Haiku North America. And she herself has published over a thousand haiku and her first full-length book of haiku and senru, Highway of Speaking Towns, won a 2016 Touchstone Distinguished Book Award. And she has many other accomplishments, uh, including haiku with a science fiction vein. And so uh, I think we'll all be very interested in her program. Um, the uh, presentation uh, Debbie and I were talking yesterday about it, and she was uh, greatly impressed by an essay by Hiroko Akai Sato, and his essay was Isa and the Hokusai. And it was noted that there were both of those uh, creative people, Isa and Hokusai, used exaggerated perspectives in their work. And so I am not going to talk too much more about that, but that Debbie will have a, a wonderful uh, presentation for us. There will be four periods of time for discussion and questions. And so just keep that in mind. Um, she'll, she'll let us know when that is. And then you can send me your information uh, through the chat and or your question through the chat. If you want to be unmuted, let me know in that chat. Otherwise, we'll, we'll work it just like uh, we've done in the last two, and then I'll read the question out, and uh, Debbie will answer it for the discussion. Uh, I think Debbie really would like lots of discuss discussion and comments, so if you want to be unmuted, I'll be happy to do that. So, Debbie, I think it's up to you now. Uh, I think Debbie, you're on, you're still muted. Let's see. Let me unmute you. I am unmuted now. I kept trying to unmute myself, and it said that the host um, had you muted. Oh. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see me now and hear me. Yes. I am going to share my screen and start my presentation that I have. Um, So I'm going to be giving a presentation on exaggerated perspective in haiku. And as Shelley mentioned, I had read this essay by um, Haraki Ito, um, and that it, you know, that there is this exaggerated perspective in both. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I went ahead too far. Um, I was trying to get my little picture of myself out of my thing. Okay, so um, the essay comes from this book, um, and if you don't have it, you should get it. And I'm going to start with, um, actually I'm going to go back to what I had said here. As Sato notes in his essay, is there anyone who knows the name Hokusai and doesn't think of this great way um, woodblock. And is there anyone who thinks of Isa who doesn't think about the snail climbing up Mount Fuji? 
And, and that's really the essence of what I want to talk about today. Um, and if you haven't read the essay, um, get this book. So we, we have the birthday of Kanagawa. And if you feel inspired to write your own haiku of um, um, exaggerated perspective during the presentation, just write it down and hopefully at the end we'll have some time to share them. Little Snail by in climb Mount Fuji. In both cases, you have the great wave and each of those little snails. Exaggeration adds to the artistry, isn't it? The wave feels particularly enormous when compared to a very small Mount Fuji. And the task of climbing Mount Fuji feels particularly daunting when you are looking at it from the perspective of a snail. Um, born in 1828, I don't know why it's not going. Um, Hokusai died in 1760 and died in 1849. And it is unknown whether they ever but they were alive at the same time. A single mosquito, a wind near my ear. It's not just a little air moving by his ear from the mosquito, but a full scale wind, which makes this far more evocative and effectively than if you just had this little bit of air from the mosquito. Here, you can look at the of Mount Fuji as being a distance. But if you look at the way Fuji is positioned underneath the bridge, it really feels like the bridge is going over Mount Fuji. And the people at the top of the bridge are looking down at Mount Fuji. Through the hole in the mosquito swarm, Kyoto. And this poem reminds me of both of the woodblocks I showed you in the sense that you're looking for something smaller, a way, a bridge, a swarm. And you're seeing something much larger, like Mount Fuji or Kyoto. And this wood block has the same effect. This is another one of Hokusai's 36 views of Mount Fuji. Most of the wood blocks I'm going to be showing you come from that series. The world of dew is a world of dew, and yet, and yet. So if we look at this famous poem, apart from the backstory we've read about and, and everything that's been written about this poem, Consider just the technical perspective of the entire world in a dewdrop. And then think about how this perspective adds to the emotional impact of this hyper. Here in this print, you have a reflection of Mount Fuji in Lake Kali. But the thing about it is the reflection doesn't match the mountain. It appears bigger, you know, the reflection of Fuji appears bigger than Fuji, and it seems to be more snow covered than the actual mountain. Here again, the roof seems higher than Mount Fuji, and it looks like they're flying kites over the mountain. And in this one, what I find striking about this is it looks like the bridge is going actually right to Mount Fuji. And so now I'm going to read and show you some contemporary English language haiku without comment. Um, I want you to think about how the exaggerator changes the haiku. And then afterwards, what I'm going to do is something similar to the Haiga presentation where I'm going to show you four haiku at a time, and we're going to open it up to discussion. And at that time, I want to hear your opinions, and then I may tell you my thoughts on them as well. 
as I read through them, I want you to think about, you know, which haikus stand out. Do you notice any similar themes? And what really makes the technique work in these poems for you? And do any of the poems don't work? You know, make a note of that and jot down any other thoughts you want to discuss in our discussion portion. Autumn mist. We taste our way through the orchard. Autumn mist. We taste our way through the orchard. Darkened village. The bat's calls bouncing off the Milky Way. Darkened village. The bat's calls bouncing off the Milky Way. Slow hands gently pruning a shape into sunset. Slow hands gently pruning a shape into sunset. Sea anemones. I touch my finger to the setting sun. Sea anemones. I touch my finger to the setting sun. Good morning, the whole world of foghorn. Great morning, the whole world of foghorn. Skyscrapers, the ant that is me beneath them. Skyscrapers, the ant that is me beneath them. Following the silence to the open field, the galaxies. Following the silence to the open field, the galaxies. Each dinner, the papad in her hand dwarfs the moon. Each dinner, the papad in her hand dwarfs the moon. Hopefully I'm saying that right. I don't know how to say the word. Deep space, what we keep from our children, what they keep from us. Deep space, what we keep from our children, what they keep from us. One by one, he hands over the spring winds, the bloom cellar. One by one, he hands over the spring winds, the balloon cellar. Globe street lamps, only one of them is the moon. Globe street lamps, only one of them is the moon. Heartland, the world winnowed down to wheat. Heartland, the world winnowed down to wheat. Moonless night, my breath lost between stars. Moonless night, my breath lost between stars. Wishing well, I scoop out the moon. Wishing well, I scoop out the moon. Fourteen thousand feet, the mountain disappears into my breathing. Fourteen thousand feet, mountain disappears into my breathing. Night fishing, my lure lost in the stars. Night fishing, my lure lost in the stars. So I'm going to hand this to Shelly just for a second to just review again the procedures if she wants to, and then we'll proceed. Okay. 
Yeah, sure. So this will be a discussion, and if you want to be unmuted, I'll be happy to do that. Or, again, you can put in your comments or questions uh, in the uh, chat, and then I'll be able to relay those to Debbie. So, either way. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I guess for the things I thought you might want to think about, but you might have other, other notes, um, I just want to mention that in some cases the exaggeration shown might be metaphorical and other times not so much. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts and reactions on these various poems and how they work for you. So I'm going to start with these first four. And um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts they'd like to share right now on any of these haiku. Autumn mist. We taste our way through the orchard by Marion Clark. Slow hands, gently pruning, shape into sunset by Joanna Ashwell. Darkened village, the bat's calls, bouncing off the Milky Way by Loris John Fazio. Sea anemones, I touch my finger, she is steady sun. Does anyone have any thoughts? Uh, Robert uh, Whalen uh, indicates hurricane winds, and Robert, I'm not sure, would you like me to unmute you on that? Okay, uh, so I'm not sure what that context was, but we do have one from David Lanoel, Dark Village. The bat calls bouncing off the Milky Way is mind blowing. The darkened village could be our little planet, such vastness, yet we are connected to it. Okay, and I'll unmute uh, Robert. He, he does want to be uh, speaking, so hang on here. All right. Okay, Robert, you are unmuted. Okay, uh, I was not necessarily uh, uh, wanting uh, to present it now. I didn't know if we were giving uh, feedback in haiku form uh, on the topic. And when you hit enter uh, to the next line, it actually sends it to you. Uh, but that was the start of Hurricane Winds finally yielding to the scent of flowers. And I didn't know if that was an example of the exaggerated perspective that you were talking about. Um, I, like I said, could you read that again? Um, I really wanted to discuss in specific these four envision this as a discussion um yes which please, i please do i i i did and i not, just want to talk about this i do want to get to people writing their own a little later but i really like if you have any thoughts for example on any of these poems like for example the first one the autumn mist we chased our way through the orchard for me i see being lost in this you can't see but you're tasting your way tree by tree through this orchard. But you're not just eating one piece of fruit, an apple or an orange or whatever this orchard is. You're eating the entire orchard, which in a way is, you know, again, you're, it, 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 to me it just adds to the feeling of being overcome by the mist. The orchard feels very big and we're eating a lot of fruit. I mean, that's kind of, my thoughts, but I'd like to hear other people's thoughts and how how it might reach them. Okay, so Marilyn uh, indicates uh, she has, feels that this has really opened up for her uh, a new understanding uh, of the uh, way haiku works. So Marilyn, we I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Yeah, let's see, just a minute. Getting several. Okay. 
Okay, Marilyn, you should be you should be unmuted. Yeah. Hi, Debbie. This Hi. is this is so exciting for me. Um, I have, as you know, I, I think possibly I'm a Tonka writer, and I'm trying to uh, open myself to haiku, which I have written. But the uh, this exaggerated perspective, the 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 moment that feels larger than the moment. Uh, because of you know particular details, this is this is extraordinary, and my my take was a little different than yours on the first uh, poem, Autumn Mist. It was as if one apple, just just eating one apple while walking through the orchard, was enough. It felt like you know eating more and being led you know through the orchard. So so. I, I love your interpretation and, and just wanted to say what mine was. But again, this is just marvelous. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Marilyn. And that's why I wanted to open this to a discussion because how the exaggeration hits different people is, can, be, can vary and the interpretation can vary. And so, like, I know that Sarah, um, wrote in the comments as if she was tasting the fruit on the mist, which is also interesting as well, like, you know, going and not actually tasting the fruit, but tasting them through the mist. So, and that's a really interesting perspective to this haiku as well. And if there's any of these four that jump out at you, I really would like to say this is you know, makes you feel. Uh, Bruce I, uh, would, uh, also has a comment. And Bruce, would you... Uh, you have Here I am. Yeah. The uh, CN Anemones, if I'm pronouncing it right, I think, of it, I think it's Icarius. I, for, it, I forget his name. The Greek character that flies and wax wings to the sun. And he gets too close, and you know what happens. They melt. And so... The sea and anemones, I know you, you can't get too close, and, and that's the setting sun. To me, that jumped right out at me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I also, on that one, I, 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 see, I think of, you know, touching the sea anemone and how it closes around your finger, and, and actually the idea of actually touching the sun in the water, you know, because... The setting sun is becomes a, me because the way it looks in the water, um, and then, and then the Icarus thing I hadn't even thought of, but I love your interpretation and how that comes out. Thank you. Okay, and then um, Bruce Kennedy. Uh, yes, I just wanted to respond to Deborah talking about the autumn mist. I didn't read it as uh, she was eating the whole orchard. But I created a story that she's wandering through the orchard, sampling trees as she goes along, perhaps groupings of different species, and that the lostness was kind of partial, at least yeah, that's how it is here, closer in New England, where you can see just some trees ahead and not beyond. So that was my take. Yeah, I, I, I think the orchard feels very big because of the mist. And, um, and, and there's just something about, you know, tasting our way through an orchard that I really just love in this poem. Okay, so our next uh, person who's been unmuted is Lynn Jambor. Hi. I um, really wanted to chat for a minute about slow hands gently pruning a shape into sunset. Um, this one I'm a little bit ambivalent about, and I'm not sure why. Uh, pruning to me often refers to, you know, pruning a hedge or trees or, or whatever. So I'm wondering about a shape into sunset. It has a lovely rhythm to it. I love just saying it aloud, but I'm, I'm not quite certain about what it means. Can you help me with that? 
Well, well, how I see that, I mean, and, and I think what's interesting is we all form our own story when you read the haiku, but I see like a solid hedge where you can't see the sunset, just like, um, mm -hmm. you know, Ray was talking earlier about when they cut down the tree, suddenly he saw the sunrise and sunset or, you know, um, and here I'm, I'm seeing someone like, pruning a tree or a hedge and suddenly bits of sunset that are behind the hedge become into view. So almost like when they trim the hedge, it's like they're trimming a shape of sunset. And so it, it feels like they're actually pruning the sunset in a weird way, you know, like making it into like a bonsai shape or something. I, I know that's what, how I see that one. When you say that, I think more generally about what is negative space. And that, that does really bring it deep, I think, into the sunset and the pruning. So um, thank you. I, I thought the, the other one I absolutely loved is the sea anemones. So great, great uh, choices there. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Jennifer Thierman, unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, I love the slow hands because I saw it as normally a sunset, brilliant, out of control, we're just zonked out, and then eventually the universe has these, or spiritual, has these slow hands that prune it into that very keen sunset that comes to the end, sort of from disorder to order. I, I thought it was gorgeous. And a quick comment on the first one. After I read it, I thought, hmm, this is more like, it could be bears or it could be mischievous children. They're hidden in the mist and they're tasting and tossing and then tasting and tossing and just having a grand old time. That's very, very interesting. I, it's a great interpretation of that. Okay. Uh, David uh, I, I, I see that um, David Lanou had put in the chat. I don't know if David wants to talk about that, the radio, about the bat calls mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Hi, David. Debbie. Um, yeah. yeah um, I see this as a sci-fi coup. I know you're into that. And my mind went right away to, we are the bats. We're blind on, in our little dark village on this tiny little planet. And there's such vastness out there. And yet it's, you know, like a good haiku. It's also literally just a darkened village and the sound of bats. But I think it reaches almost a science, not science fiction, just a science aspect of really where we are in this universe. What do you think? You know, that's a really interesting thought, and I'm glad you pointed it out to me because I'm always going to, I'm going to, you know, it makes me appreciate this poem even more. I always thought, you know, of literally the bats, you know, be this echo, this mixture of the sounds and the sights and the bats echoing so much that it feels like they're bouncing off the Milky Way, which is so far away that's physically impossible. So that's how I was seeing it as an exaggerated kind of perspective that these calls are so far pouncing off the Milky Way and coming back. Um, but I do love your, your radio wave interpretation. That's interesting. Thank you for that. And we have uh, Richard Schilling is now unmuted. Or no, uh, actually, you're still muted, uh, Rich, if you could unmute yourself. Okay. All right. So I'll just read what he has said. Um, he indicates less hedges show more sunset. <laughs> so uh, that I think that was a comment about the slow hands gently pruning a shape into sunset. That's good. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's not anything else, 
Oh, interesting. Um, Robert Whelan's, I don't know if he wanted to say. Yeah. Right. Uh, Robert, I can unmute you also. There we go. Thanks. I want to apologize for the uh, rude intrusion prior. Um, the, this particular haiku to me, uh, with the slowing of hands, uh, but into sunset. So slow hands gently pruning a shape into sunset. Your life is passing at its pace and bits have been trimmed to become the shape of who you are into the end of the day. That's, that's how I read that one. Beautiful. Thank okay. you for sharing that. It's beautiful. Uh, Janice uh, also would like to make a comment, and I've unmuted her. Leave. Let's see. Janice, let's see. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Janice. Try now to unmute yourself. Okay, it worked now. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. With slow hands, um, in addition to the actual pruning, I see it as the person who is doing the, the pruning is old and pruning slowly and is pruning herself or himself into the sunset of life. Yeah. So, Debbie, there's a few more uh, comments. Did you want to uh, hold off on them and continue on? Um, or um, no, let's, let's go to the next one. I, I saw there were a couple others on the darkened village of maybe just one of those, and then I'd like to maybe go on to the next four. Okay, let's see. Do you see who had the comment about the one you wanted to see? Um, let me let me write that. To, let me pull it down. Because I don't reason. see any on the darkened village. Um, well, I actually saw two. I saw Bruce Kennedy and also Greer Greer's. Okay, um, let me get Bruce. Oh hi. Yeah, I was just interpreting this or seeing this as a picture. And in that sense, the Milky Way can be so large and dominant and white and bright. Uh, <clears throat> and that when you hear bat calls, any sound, like a bird calls, sometimes you don't know where it's coming. So visually, the Milky Way could be so dominant, I could see you as, uh, as, as if the sounds are bouncing off of that big white wall in the sky. Yeah, that was okay. beautiful. Uh, I do see you, uh, Greer, so I'll uh, unmute that. Greer, are you there? Oh, hi, do you hear me? Yes. I'm Okay, I'm not sure yes. what I'm doing here. <laughs> Hold on, let me get back to what I wrote. Um, well, of course, you think of about as little a Milky Way as large. But looking at it another way, uh, if you see a whole bunch of bats flying out of a cave or from under a bridge, they're big. So they might uh, obscure the Milky Way. So they may seem bigger than they are as a congregate. I'm not sure that happens at the same time, though. I think the bats go out more at uh, twilight, you'd have to wait till later to see the Milky Way. But I'm just playing with perspective here. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's just another way of looking at it. It's that just, you know, the bat versus the Milky Way. Uh, I'm thinking move on. Of, yeah, we have one more from Soretta, so. Okay. Loretta, you're unmuted. Here I am. Thank you. Okay, well, I was seeing this zoom effect of the 
the macro, the tiny and the large that all of these poems have in common. And also the use of senses. There's so much in, all in each, in each poem, it's really full of senses. For instance, the mist and the taste of the apples or whatever it is, it's in the orchard. So one of it would be a sense on your skin and the other one would be, be the sense of taste. And then we get the visual of the orchard the sound of the bats, and then the darkness and also the brightness of the Milky Way. So each one has, has such a full picture of, of um, something very large, all within a few lines. And the touch and visual of the sun and the sea anemones and, and their tentacles um, in relationship to the fingers. So there's just so much to look at in each one of these poems. I think they're wonderful examples of, of what Debbie's talking about. Thank you. Thank you. And move to the next four. Okay, so I have one of mine, which I threw in. Um, gray morning, the whole world of foghorn, following the silence to the open field, the galaxies, skyscrapers, the ant that is me beneath them, and Beach Jenner, the papad in her hand towards the moon. And I'd really like to hear what you think of these. Uh, we do have a con uh, I'm going to unmute the Michael Dillon in the world. He had, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, Michael. I'm going to try it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, my comment was that um, uh, your presentation relates to the idea uh, that Ishihara has written about talking about hyperbole, deliberately using hyperbole in haiku. And the way he put it was to tell the truth as if it were false. Normally in creative writing, we're used to telling the false as if it were true. But his notion is the opposite, um, to, to deliberately create hyperbole as your examples, previous examples uh, at least uh, demonstrated, that uh, you tell the truth as if it were false. Um, and it's uh, something to wrap your head around, but it definitely, what you're talking about definitely relates to his notions of hyperbole. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good point um, because you know, the, like I was saying, I feel the most active these poems is is um, heightened by the exaggeration or the hype, as you you put it. And I mean, because it is hyperbole as well. Um, and and I think that we do come up to a, a higher emotional truth um, when you do that. Except I think Ishihara is talking about deliberately exploring falseness. And, and obviously true. when we write the false as if it were true, we're telling the truth that's with fiction that's more true than reality. But he, I think he's trying to get at something opposite um, about deliberately exploring the false and the untrue because it creates an emotional effect as these poems exactly do. Yeah. Okay, we have the next comment from Michael Riley. Yeah, I, I really love Gray Morning. The, <laughs> I live in the land of uh, lighthouses and foghorns and uh, on Lake Huron. And uh, that one just rings true. And I love the fact the whole world seems like it's caught in, the, in where you are because everything around you is the sound of the foghorn and the rolling of the fog. It just sort of ties it all together. It's, it's almost not an exaggeration to me because that's the way, that's the way I think of it. But uh, that's, uh, that's really well done. You captured it well. Thank you. Okay, one from Marilyn. Um, 
Just a moment, let me find you. Okay, Marilyn. Yeah, going back to my appreciating and understanding the impact of haiku, I really like you know, you were saying that you get to a higher emotional truth. And along with that, you know, because it's out of telling something that's false in order to get to that higher emotional truth. That's really fascinating. I am so glad I'm here right now. Thank you. Okay, and then looks like Bruce. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I did take care of that. Sorry. Uh, any others? Okay. Okay, um, okay well, I don't. Yeah, Bruce. One has, more. Yeah, do you want to move on? There is one more that popped in. Okay. Okay, and this is from Bruce Kennedy. Yeah, I just really like the the uh, the pat pat, however you pronounce it, haiku, and that the the foo there doesn't just visually dwarf the moon, but socially and in practical terms, it dwarfs it. It's much more important in a beach dinner to have food and to share it with your friends than the than the moon. So it dwarfs it socially and and practically as well. Yeah, thank you, friend. Um, anything else? Okay, I just want to stay really fast on the skyscrapers. That one kind of reminds me of the snail climbing Mount Fuji. Now, that one's a little more metaphorical because you're not saying the ant is under the sky trap. You know, you're saying the ant that is me beneath them. But because you're comparing the skyscraper to an ant, the skyscrapers feel, you know, a hundred times taller than they normally would. And in the same vein, um, the silence of the open field with the galaxies. Um, space images in general work really well with this type of haiku because, you know, of course, I, as David Lanoue pointed out, I, I like outer space images, but um, it's just that the galaxies, it just feels so much bigger, you know, the silence feel more enormous when you think of it in terms of the galaxies. Let me go to the next four. Um, deep space, what we keep from our children, what they keep from us. One by one, he hands over the spring winds, the balloon cellar, globe street lamps, only one of them is the moon. Heartland, the world winnowed down to wheat. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on these, how they work for you. Okay, we have a comment from Robert. I'll mute him here real quick. Okay, Robert. Uh, th this one right from the beginning uh, totally floored me because when we think of the distance between people and how intimacy is hurt and how intense that hurt can be between a parent and a child, but also to be separate people is important. And so this, this was so poignant to me because this is an eight ounce glass that's holding three gallons of meaning. Uh, it's unbelievably good. Uh, the balloon seller was my second favorite, but uh, this one was great. Yeah, again, I feel like the deep space being so vast, it's just so enormous. You have this generational divide between us and our kids. And I mean, it just seems almost 
in a fathomable distance at times, even from people who you're very close to. Yep. So yeah, there's something about it that's just really emotionally resonant and Terry Ann did a great job with that one. Okay, and sorry, um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, mine was just more of a comment, all since we were talking, uh, discussing the deep space one, it just took me, uh, I mean, a lot of good haiku often take me to a, a soundtrack, and that one just took me to uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Teach Your Children Well, you know, yeah. it's the same feeling that I get from when I hear that song, which you know, you, you, you can't uh, hear without going on a journey. And this haiku sort of t uh, takes me on that same journey. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I love the balloon seller one too. It was in this wonderful children's picture book that Bill Higginson edited years ago. And just the idea of handing over the wind that the balloon seller is actually selling the spring wind to people. I just love that. Anything else on this page before I move to the next one? Um, I just say that um, on Cathabella's globe street lamps, you know, moon becomes a street lamp like Clayton Beach's sun becomes a sea anemone. enemy. Um, just a very effective kind of device you can use in a haiku. I really love this one. Um, she um, wrote it actually in workshop. Yes? And Bruce Pfeiffer also has uh, a comment. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, the moon, I remember always reading the children's fables about people trying to capture the moon. And the one about the blocking the moon with the food, I think it was called the pom-pom or pat-pat. But here yeah. it's different because now the moon is being confused with a street lamp. It's like, I guess, the same size as the globe. And so this is like reversing in my mind, as opposed to the moon being such a big thing that everybody's uh, are ca trying to get it, the reflection of it in the pond and all. That was just what came to my mind. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jill Lane. Hi, I've been trying to comment so often that I couldn't get through till now. Uh, the, the Globe Street lamps impressed me very much. I'm very attached to the moon and I often feel like the moon is down here near me. And so this one struck me deeply. Uh, I also wanted to say something, if I could, back on the foghorn. Um, I spent 20 summers up on Lake Michigan and the foghorn was important. Later on, back home, right at the turn of this millennium, they canceled the foghorn for, for Saugatuck, Michigan, and it broke my heart. It, it makes such a difference. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have uh, Marilyn. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, when I first saw the Heartland poem, it didn't quite, you know, um, work for me. It uh, it did, but it didn't. But now it's it's really quite. I see it. I mean, I feel it. The heartland is so big, and it comes down. The whole world comes down to wheat, to being on the ground, to working with the wheat, to cutting the wheat, to growing it, and I really. I, that's very, very emotional. The other thing, um, and the D's, the D's in the first and the second line, and then the T that ends it. Yes, yes. Yeah. It, 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 it has a wonderful sound to it as well as this illustrating this principle. Um, and, and again, the world, you know, you, you think of the world as dew, the world as a foghorn, the world as wheat. Um, I'm just, you know, kind of a lovely way of, of kind of encapsulating where your place in the world is and how that becomes your whole world at that point in life. So, you know. Mm, nice. And we have Soretta. Okay, here I am, Sarita. Sarita, um, sorry. 
That's okay. Um, well, there was a, uh, first about the Heartland one. I went to a much different place with that in that for me, it's a very sad poem because it speaks to the farmer's loss of of earnings of their crops and that have, has repeated itself throughout history, um, one plight after another, um, and even extending it to the Dust Bowl. And I mean, you can go a long ways with that idea. So um, it, it hit me right in the heartland, so to speak, because that's where I went with it. And the other poem that I just dearly love is the one about the balloon seller, because it speaks to the magical um, aspect of childhood, of being a young child, maybe your first balloon, and how it seems as though the, the, the wind is actually captured in that balloon. Um, children don't have the same sense of reality that we have. And I recall my son asking me when he was little, does the tree, do the trees blowing make, let me see, does the tree blowing make the wind move? So he saw it totally opposite of what the actual thing was happening because he could see the tree, but he couldn't see the wind. So I love that magical quality in that. Thank yeah. you, Debbie. This is a wonderful workshop. Thank you so much. I'm going to move to the next one. Um, I'm not going to read. I'm just trying to save time um, because I realized that we're getting down um, to time. Um, um, so I wanted to know your thoughts on any of these four poems. Um, again, for myself, you've got the moon again with Lucy Whitehead and her wishing well, I scoop out the moon because in the reflection of the moon becomes the moon. And that, you know, kind of reminds me of the reflection of Mount Fuji in the um, um, wood block print where Mount Fuji looks too big here. The moon is very small in the bottom of the well when we scoop it out, um, which also makes me think of this other one by Stuart Bartow about the night fishing, my lure lost in the stars. You have the reflection of the stars. And to me, that feels like it's hopeless that this lure is, is lost to these millions of stars on this lake. And I'll never find it ever. There's no chance I'm ever going to find this lure. I mean, even though I can pull it back in, but it's just out there, you know? I mean, did we lose it just by visually when we cast or did we actually drop the lure and it's missing and it's gone? So um, those are my thoughts on those two. I don't know if you have any others. I, I see uh, that- David, um, David does, uh -huh. Hi, Debbie again. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I posted to the group, Itza had a nice haiku about the moon and a flea and a sake cup. But yes. this is kind of a cliche, the moon reflection. But I it really, is. really like this poem by Lucy Whitehead because of the word wishing. I think the wishing well makes the cliche, not a cliche, it's fresh again. Now there's some feeling, some desire, making a wish, a yearning. Uh, someone in the group said they, 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 they feel the moon. I think it's, it's great. Anyway, that's my thought on that one. And then Bruce, did you want to add to your comment? Um, sure. Uh, there's just a Zen phrase. Uh, I collect Zen calligraphy uh, that's famous. It goes, scoop water and the moon is in your hand. And it kind of gets that, um, this whole image of the moon in water. It's everywhere in the water. You can't just separate it out, and yet it's nowhere. Um, so sometimes I've done that. I've stolen or created haiku out of some classical Chinese poetry, and I think that's where this comes from. I think Basho has as well. And I don't know Lucy Whitehead, but uh, I could see her having riffed off of uh, 
of that classical phrase. Okay, and then we have Jennifer. Y yes, hi. Um, just another brief comment on this wishing well uh, haiku. One of the things that makes this poem work to me, work for me, despite the the whole sort of wishing reflection in the wishing well cliche, is that typically you throw coins into the wishing well. Here, you're actually ripping something out, and it's not just something; it's the moon. Um, and I just kind of love that it's opposite. It's backwards of really what the cliche of, of a wishing well really is all about. And that's what makes it work for me. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I think we had Mar Bar. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's me. Yep. It's Marita. Can okay. you see me? Y yes. Okay. Um, I also, I like, um, I wanted to comment on the wishing well, because to me, I thought of it as a somewhat futile thing because no matter how many times you have the moon in your hands or can scoop it out, it just returns to the well. So that's how I felt. I felt if it was like uh, trying something re repetitively that ultimately doesn't really come to pass. A fleeting thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Unfortunately, it looks like we're getting kind of low on discussion, so we haven't had a chance to discuss the other. I just, um, if you wrote something and you want to put it in the chat, please do. So we're not going to really have time to do a haiku sharing because it looks like we only have about three minutes. I do have some more wood blocks I wanted to show you before. I'm just going to scan, go through them really fast, and maybe you could, people could put in the chat any haiku that inspired these or if you have any comments on those last two about the mountain disappearing into your breathing um you know the mountain doesn't really disappear but it's so hard to breathe at 14,000 feet you're climbing mount whitney or whatever mount you're climbing um it's just very effective and also the same thing with cat layman's where she's losing her breath between the stars um but i'm going to go through and and this was my writing assignment that I wanted you guys to do, but you know, I'd love to, to see if any of you come up with anything. And then I'm gonna just go through these last wood blocks, you know, the small Mount Fuji perspectives. And I just wanted to show them, you know, again, the roof higher than Fuji, the kite above Fuji, you know, Fuji very small here when they're doing their work. Um, these are a couple from the 10 extra views. I, the last three here are, in, you know, and um, this last one is the only one I, I put in here. It doesn't have um, Fuji in it. It's from um, Hokusai's um, waterfall, Waterfalls in Various Provinces um, series. And what I love about this is that the pull of water at the top of the waterfall is so gigantic. Um, the cliffs look like waves, so that it looks like the people on the blank raft on a wave and then looking up in terror at this whole thing falling down on them. And um, anyway, that could, and then I'm ending, of course, with my great wave. And that really concludes. Here is my contact information if you want to get in touch with me. And if anyone has any further comments, I know that we're like well, actually out of time. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this.